influence and speak about who's like going to campus um, as an all or so so or whoever is interested. <laughs> um, deal. So the first is called Which Lives Matter by Monty Washington. And he discusses the people behind the movement and the importance of addressing racism, which we think is something that our campus does. Be equity inclusion on college campuses. Um, and then the next person, the next speaker that we discussed for you um, discusses Title IX and what to think of the need for happens on campus, which is the, the prevention programs we have, but what actually do them happen, which is also something our campus desperately needs. Um, we believe that these programs are the first job on campus, and we are thinking that we could pose this to all orders um, at the top of the page though. As well as some other clubs on campus. Awesome. Does anyone have any questions for CN? All right. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing that in the future. Um, ICC? Yes. Hello. Um, so I know what Meredith said. Um, we met both of uh, the leaders and they're both lovely people and we would really like to have them. Uh, Monty Washington has actually he has two states left that he's never been to, and it was Rhode Island and Alaska. <laughs> so he's very eager to come to Rhode Island. <laughs> so I don't know, I guess Rhode Island and all those. But uh, this past weekend, we had our senior David Buffers event as well. On Sunday, we had our all team event, both of those went really well. Um, this week on Wednesday, sophomores are putting on the annual Day Point dinner. It is a Charlie Brown theme. So Chef Nate has checked up some pretty awesome, a pretty awesome menu. Um, the shuttle should be available that evening, fingers crossed, we reached out to them, but you never know. So um, we're hoping for the best. Um, there'll be like a Thanksgiving dinner for that team, which um, I think I have some links. I'm not going to, what is that? Mac and cheese balls, possibly. I'm not, don't quote me on that, but I'm going to hope so. Um, so if you can come, that'd be great. Um, yeah, okay. And then this Sunday, the freshmen will be having their first event. It is called Nub Night. They will have nuggets from McDonald's, vegan nuggets from Plant City for people who do not eat meat, as well as the, um, and common. So we'll have some from dining. Um, they're also will be painting canvases and different things like that. And as we speak, they're currently having their first committee meeting, so they're jumping right in. Great. All right, that's it for me. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions for ICC? <clears throat> All right, Hawks Herald. Questions for the Hawks Herald. Awesome. Saga? All right. Hello, everybody. Um, this week on Friday, we're going to have a co sponsored event with Roger After Dark um, at 10 o'clock this Friday, where we're going to do tie dye, karaoke, and it's going to be free food that's in BHH. Uh, the tie dye is happening in the atrium, and the karaoke is happening in Studio One. Um, and then next week is Trans Week of Remembrance already. Um, so I'm going to go through all the events for that. Don't feel like you need to jot them down really quick. They're all happening already. Um, so the Monday event is going to be a clothing swap in the Q track. So bring clothes you don't want, take clothes you want. Um, and then we'll be gathering and having snacks at 8 p.m. in the Q track. On Tuesday, we're doing a parquet social in the Hawks Nest from 12 to 1. On Wednesday, uh, we're having just a regular GM meeting and then potentially collaborating with WQRI to have a playlist playing um, at some point in the day from with music and trans artists. Um, on Thursday, we're having a webinar from uh, webinar presentation by Gottman and a QA. and a uh, So there's going to be, um, Gottman's coming in through Zoom, so you can gather in DHHDO1 to watch or on Zoom, um, just like in your room, wherever. Uh, on Friday, we're having our annual trans day of remembrance vigil at 5 o'clock in front of the rec center. So like I said, all that's on Hawking. And then, on Saturday the 20th, we will be joining the Law Alliance for their Friendsgiving. So, anyone have any questions for Saga? Awesome. And WQRI. Do you have a report from WQRI? 
Thank you. WQRI hosted our open mic night on Saturday and it went spectacularly. Over 15 performers and dozens of attendees in the next Many talented people performed and we were so happy to help support our fellow classmates. As always, we have many members of our Gen staff meetings and have lots of fun. Any questions you can email uh, WQRI. Our advisors. Hi everyone. Um, student or uh, senior portraits are taking place this week and next week, so please make sure that if you generally have a meeting in the chamber, that you are figuring out where your location is for this week as well as next week. Your advisors should definitely have that information if you have not received it since you've fallen. Um, just as um, no classes Thursday, um, so please, I encourage you to take this time to rest, um, refresh yourselves, you know, still get some work done, but I encourage you try not to schedule meetings um, during this day. Um, also take time to um, uh, remember our veterans. Um, there is a November 10th at 11 a.m. Um, in front of the flagpole. So I encourage you to um, please go and attend. I know there's a committee happening at that time, but um, I encourage you all to do that. Um, over the course of the weekend, definitely make sure you're taking time for yourselves and relaxing. Definitely um, support other orgs programs, but please just make sure that you are um, being, doing the self care and these are all y'all are staying healthy. Um, John King did send out an email about um, the RWB blade. Um, <laughs> but please just make sure, especially with the time change, everything that you are taking care of yourself, getting enough rest, getting enough water in, um, getting in all those appropriate nutrients. And I won't even tell you what that means. So if you more invite come see me. <laughs> I second what Adrian said. It's also a fun reminder that Thanksgiving break is around the corner. All coming back here, please keep testing. If you need to change your day, do it, but make sure you are getting the testing that you're looking for. All right. Any questions for our advisors? Oh, certainly, yeah. Um, it didn't want Does everyone know what survey we're talking about? No. Just for. Yeah, we're trying to pull it really quick. I worked on that I survey. I don't know. Do you want to show? No, no. 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 <laughs> no. is this. Um, <laughs> everyone in this group knows anti racism was a demand out of the protest a few weeks ago. It was a student senate resolution. Um, the marketing team has been meeting with Stephanie to figure out the logistics of how we can make this campaign happen as soon as possible. Um, realistically, the first step is a survey to all students um, to understand what they are specifically looking for out of that campaign. Obviously, it's multiple choice, their own direction. Um, we've kind of compiled all of our thoughts and options into, into one space in that survey for you to kind of dig in and, and share your feedback. And that will um, get us to the first step, which is an in-person session on November 30th. Um, so all of that information will be taken there. It will be brought into a brainstorming session with students. But let's think really after November 30th, we will go home. So that's why we feel it's really important that we have that in-person session you can gather that information, work when you're all on break, and then when you come back, uh, really hit the ground running. And the goal would be to have the campaign started by February 1. So that would be possible. Any questions for our advisors? Alex? Is there a spot on the survey that if for students to put any like specific things that they would like, like a short answer question? Yeah, so I can, here, I'll just go through the whole thing. So when you log into the survey, the first thing that it's going to ask you um, is who the audience 
I'm sorry. Goal. Sorry, we said it goal. So the first thing is the goal, and it, it gives multiple answers, and you rank them and strongly agree, disagree, neutral, whatever it may be in terms of the gamut. The next section is to ask you uh, the methods for the campaign, website, TikTok, you name it. We went down the list, and there again, that's a ranking system. And then from there, there's a bottom paragraph to your point where, like, if there was another thing we didn't list or didn't think of that we wanted to write in the query entry, you could do that. The next box is to allow you to write any like slogan ideas. I mean, it's open ended, it's just that's the very last thing in the box. And then the final, final question is if you want to be physically a part of the process beyond that survey, please give us your main email, what have you, and then, and then we'll be able to reach back out to you. John? Uh, my other question is so the the samples are going to be in detention, right? So, has there been email sent out already to all the org? Or... So, I don't know. I Any other questions for our advisors? Oh, it's my turn. All right, moving on to executive reports. All right, hello everyone. I hope you all had a great weekend. First and foremost, um, please write this down. Provost Everett will be coming to Senate December 6th. And specifically, she'll be discussing the update on implicit bias training, the general education curriculum and how DEI will be incorporated into that and how the faculty um, contract process is going. So look for more information on that soon and post coming to let everyone know to come. Um, on Monday, November 22nd, um, our meeting will be canceled as we believe it's important for people to relax and take, um, take that time before going home for a Thanksgiving break. Um, I am looking forward to interviewing people this week for our three open, open positions we have on Senate. I also had lunch this week on Wednesday with the president, the provost and vice president of student life, um, Dr. John King. As far as updates go, we'll be looking at having Dr. King with us at Senate towards one of the last meetings of the semester. In this meeting, he'll be going over the new student conduct process and how students will be involved in that. They're kind of in the middle of figuring that out now, trying to take the old method of how students were incorporated in conduct and kind of update it as to how you want it to look now. And he said he'll have a update um, on that or it's one of the last meetings of the semester and it will 100% be ready to be rolled out spring semester. Um, I'll take that in one second. <laughs> um, oh yes, also during this meeting, we discussed the um, implicit bias training and what that's going to be looked like with the provost. I was able to express my deep, deep concern um, to everyone there that implicit bias training should not just be an EverFi course, and this needs to be something that's more engaging um, so faculty can actually learn about implicit biases, not just click through the um, EverFi course. So they were very open to that as well, and the provost will be giving more of an update on that when she comes to the meeting. As we're speaking, there are meetings being had with the provost and the president of the faculty union because anything that is going to be put into the contract needs to be gone through with the faculty union president at first. So conversation on the trainings will be had with her and it will be pushed um, more towards the contract process. Uh, hmm, yes, I think that is all I have. I saw Mike. I was wondering what was the day that Provost Everett's meeting? Uh, December 6th. Thank you. And Monday, November 22nd will be canceled. <coughs> Anyone else have any questions for me? Sure. <laughs> Thought you had your hand. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. We're moving on to our vice president's report. All right. Happy Monday, everyone. Uh, one on ones are going smoothly. Thank you to everyone that's had one for being open and honest. We appreciate that. In Thank you again for sharing not only what's going well, but also your concerns as they come up. That's really important so that myself and eBoard 
and our advisors can work on those improvements and work to better everyone's experience on Senate. Uh, for those of you on Senate for more than three weeks, please be sure to sign up if you have not done so by Tuesday at five. There's lots of different time slots this week. For our newer senators, we'll be doing one-on-ones later on, so you have a little bit more time on Senate to have kind of those discussions. As a reminder, as our advisor said, all committees and councils that usually meet in the chambers will not be there, and they will be in CAS 224 this week. Uh, chairs already know locations for next week, and they'll be letting you know. Uh, plans are in the works for a fun holiday-themed Senate social with some of our favorite traditions, so be on the lookout for that. And finally, we'll be having another caucus tonight after we adjourn, and we have committee cabinet after as well. So stay tuned for some more fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You always end on such a positive note. How could you be upset? No. <laughs> Anyone have any questions for Adam? Lovely. Moving on to our treasures report. Uh, happy Monday, everyone. Um, nothing major to report on this week. Um, budget is still looking good. <laughs> yeah. Any questions for our treasurer? Secretary's report. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday. Um, since it is Veterans Day on Thursday, there's going to be no office hours and no business goes up um, for the week of Thanksgiving. So the 22nd to the 26th, there won't be any office hours either. Um, and then in terms of when you're actually in the office, just please be mindful of others who are in there as well and trying to do work because sometimes the office gets a little loud and then it's hard for people to get work done and mandatory assignments. Um, other than that, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your week and I look forward to discussing on the call. Do we have any questions for Amanda? Lovely, our parliamentarians report. Hi everyone. So when you get a chance, please take a look at the Parley Pro and helpful info folder in the Google Drive for any helpful one sheets. I'm constantly making new ones. Um, here are the ones that I have made and uploaded so far. I've done a what's what at a Senate meeting, our sister schools, and then in the form, uh, in the document, each of the sister schools websites are hyperlinked. So I'm going to keep those up. Um, resolutions versus bills and a sheet on that. The point or motion cheat sheet, an open debate and straw poll sheet, a new senator checklist, legislative rules, how to do demerit appeals, and, and a sheet that gives helpful um, terms for legislation writing, which that sheet is called bill writing. Um, look at these sheets if you have any questions, and as always, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have, need any clarification on anything. Due to there being four general Senate meetings left, we have decided to postpone the launch of Monday until next semester. This will allow us to work out how to utilize the program and um, make other decisions, as well as working on any technicalities and logistical issues at winter retreat. Another thing that we will be presented um, at winter retreat is an internal Senate diversity, equity, and inclusion project. This project will be launched at winter retreat, so there are not many details on it yet. What we do know is that the project will allow senators to do some research into different identities with the goal of seeing how we can advocate for a better RWU experience for these students. We will share more details on this project as they are finalized. Um, your Parley Pro fun fact is about legislation collaboration. In Article 4, Section 7 of the bylaws, it lays out that when senators are working on an initiative that correlates with the purpose or mission of another club, organization, department, administrator, um, senators are encouraged to contact those groups uh, in order to collaborate with them on any writing of resolutions or development of said initiatives. This section also lists out suggested methods of reaching out to these individuals or groups, so make sure to check it out. That's all I have. Anyone have any questions for Ellie? Darren? For open debate, uh, does the senator defer to one of us in the audience? Or you, in regards to what? Uh, if we have to comment um, during open debate. So during open debate, anybody can get put on the speakers list. Um, the only time when the senator would have to yield a speaking turn to an audience member, if, a, if an audience member wanted to comment on something, would be during old or new business. Um, so. We have two open debate questions tonight, so you all please feel more than welcome to put your name on the speakers list and give your feedback. Anyone else have any questions for Ollie? All right, moving on to our committee reports, and we'll start with finance. Gosh, sorry. Hello, everyone. 
Um, during this prior meeting, we had three clubs come in for funding requests this week. Um, first was the outing club who came in for a request of $900 for, bus, um, for buses for the next um, outing location. The line was cut to $700 with the discretion of the committee. Um, next was the American Institute of Architecture students who are already allocated um, a sum of money due to their venue line and were allocated $500 to fill in the gap for their ball. And then finally was the Electrical Engineering Club who came in with a request of $75 for the trivia night, which was funded in full. Um, currently, we also have Barbershop Club, which we will have an emergency meeting for this Wednesday, Wednesday at 3.30. Um, the location is still to be determined. And for committee assignments, the committee has fully reviewed sections one through 10 of the article of Article 7 of the Student Senate Bylaws, and we'll be reviewing sections 11 through 22 to finish the entirety of Article 7. Does anyone have any questions for finance? Awesome, moving on to clubs and orgs. Hello everyone, I hope you all had a good weekend. Uh, this past, past week we had our first full club hearing finally, uh, the inmate got approved. Uh, I would like to say congratulations to Arlex and Robotics for being inducted to all those committee members, especially my new committee members who were there who asked questions and got involved. Thank you very much, I know that was hard being as a committee <laughs> meeting. Brief explanation. I'm sorry about that. I wish I could have got you guys in a little slower. Um, so I would also like to let everyone know that the uh, Senator monthly report is now open for those that have extensions and those that who have not gone that in should also get it in, please. Um, this week, uh, I am also going to be having bylaw come in or two members on my committee that are on bylaw come in to discuss what they are doing with the Finalists for Clubs and Orgs on November 6th and what the handbook will look like. And yeah. lastly, we will possibly be having two club hearings this week. I will get back to you on that. They may or may not be coming in. We will see. Any questions for Brian? John? Uh, what if a club has still not got feedback? Let me know and I'll email them. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. Oh, all right. Yeah. Any other questions for Brian? All right, moving on to student life. Good evening, Senate. Last week, we were able to sit down as a committee and brainstorm ideas for what it would look like if we were to have some sort of self-defense seminar on campus. Some things that we discussed were whether or not it would be one event or several. We acknowledge that there are a variety of topics that this seminar could cover. We are still working out what it would exactly consist of, but the seminar would be hands-on. Meaning you're not just gonna sit down and listen to, ooh, what would I do? It would be um, very interactive. Um, what is learned in the seminar would be able to be provided in a variety of settings. More to come in the upcoming weeks on what the committee decides. Um, the seminar would not happen this semester. If anything, we would work out the perks for the remainder of the time we have left and have a plan for student life in the spring. Um, Jen Stanley is coming tomorrow during our normal committee time to talk about Title IX and the programs and training she has held in the past and what is being done for the future. We will also be asking her questions about what we as senators and students can do to participate in trainings um, and help draw more awareness to the things that should be done. Um, any questions, let me know. Any questions? Yana? Um, where are student life meetings? CAS 224 tomorrow. Three. Any other questions for Alex? All right, moving on to academic affairs. Good evening, folks, and happy Monday. Last week, academic affairs participated in a 30 minute icebreaker to welcome our new committee member with a listening exercise. Uh, once we concluded, we spent the other half of the meeting reviewing the debate topic on potentially having scholarships that can be allocated for both expenditures. Uh, we are currently brainstorming action items for our four guest speakers coming from accessibility services as well as hearing staff uh, scheduled for November 16th. And with that, we'll do all the great meetings. Any questions for Zach? All right, moving on to PR. Hi, everyone. So a couple of weeks ago at one of our Senate meetings, um, students in the audience made the request that we post more about how student sent supports and stands to students. In response to that, and this past Thursday, I made a post um, for First Generation Day, reaffirming that we support first generation learners 
Creating posts where we reaffirm our stance of support for different student groups on days of significance to them is something that we will continue to do, along with incorporating ways in which we are actively trying to make said group student experience better. Any questions for PR? All right, moving on to our ad hoc and council reports. I think we start with, oh yeah, the exploration, ad hoc council exploration. Okay, continue. <laughs> um, hello everyone, and happy Monday. Um, it's pretty short today, but transition binders are underway at the committee, and the committee is now wrapping up, and we will be introducing the bill. Yeah. Anyone have any questions for Louise? Awesome. I think it's far along. Yeah. Hi again. Um, so we went through more of Article 7 today and we came to a part in the bylaws that we thought warranted an open debate discussion. So I'm looking forward to that discussion. Any questions for bylaw? All right, and our parking. Hello, all. We discussed ideas this week for the resolution on the table this week. I hope you are looking forward to that. And for the first time ever, we did not have a single issue. Any questions can be emailed to the Park Council email. All right. Anyone have any university committee reports to report on? I'll start with Adam and go Zach. At the November faculty senate meeting, President Mayalis discussed the university's response to the recent bias incidents and progress on the campus master planning process. Uh, Provost Everett shared information on the space reallocation committee, which is looking at how can current space be better utilized. And the executive director search for real estate initiatives and information on the student senate resolution related to implicit bias training. A chief diversity officer at Kumba Bay shared that the university is looking into joining uh, three federal trio programs aimed at assisting first gen, low income, and underrepresented groups throughout their undergraduate experience, as well as research opportunities. And the university administration sent faculty sent a proposal for the revised academic standard policies or ASP uh, to work towards standardizing policies across all of the schools. Uh, one concern raised by the faculty dealt with curriculum, the curriculum management software that the, that the university uses in conversations with the registrar and provost are undergoing to see if they can find a resolution. Any questions for Adam? Hi. Hi. You're, you're good. You're good. You're good. Do you have any more knowledge of what we had said about when you said President Mialis had stated that it would be saying to the university to the university? Oh, that was to the faculty center. Yeah, do you have any more knowledge about what you're talking about? Or, is that like, or can I find that information? So he shared that, the, that there were bias incidents that occurred on campus recently and worked through that they had a listening session with Vice President King and Chief of Staff Okumpa Bay including students, and also an update on what the university is doing moving forward. Any other questions for Adam? All right, go ahead, Zach. Uh, so the campus leadership team recommenced last Thursday, and we began reviewing the cohort five core evaluation comparison data, which to dumb that down, that's just ever five, and more so what that really looks like from last year to now, what we're trying to advance the survey to look like. Uh, overall, the committee is still in the process of like assessment efforts, and then we wait uh, when we start with the next one. Any questions for Zach? Awesome. With that being said, do we have any motions? Mm -hmm. Oh, do you have something else? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The Title Nine Student Task Force met today for the first time this academic year. The committee, which comprises about five students, discussed introductions and vision for the committee. We had a conversation on Title IX since the implementation of the updated federal regulation in August of 2020 by the Trump administration was incorporated. Uh, updates regarding the social respect initiative were also discussed. And lastly, discussed updates for the Rhode Island Student Collaborative uh, Council. Any questions for that? Okay. Thank you. All right. With that being said, do, do we have any motion? Motion to open the debate. Second. All those in favor of opening up the debate. All as opposed, abstentions. Uh, we're now in open debate. Do we have any topics of debate for open debate? Brian. Uh, uh, 
Thank you, your question. Yeah, would the Senate, uh, student Senate benefit from particip participating in yearly student leadership trainings as a collective group? Would you like to elaborate? Uh, I will yield to Izzy. Great, thank you. So, um, <clears throat> something that I found that I felt as though uh, we would all really, really benefit from um, is participating in some of the leaders, uh, student leadership trainings that a lot of us are participating elsewhere. Um, or that's, uh, a lot, I would say a lot of us, because not everyone maybe does. Um, yearly trainings like those may look like Safe Zone, Green Dot Bystander Intervention Training, um, Implicit Bias and Inclusive Leadership, Narcan, CPR, um, things along that nature. Um, I won't go into too much into the talking points because each uh, talking point is specific to what we researched on for trainings, um, but I am excited to watch the conversation unfold. So I hope everyone participates. Adrian. Would I request that the group um, rephrase the question for debate? Yeah, so when we get to the motions, I'm going to make a motion to amend it. Oh, you can motion to amend it now. Oh, okay, cool. Can I make a motion to amend the question to what are the benefits of student senate participating in yearly student leadership trainings as a collective group? Does that work? All those, all those in favor of making that change? All those opposed? Mentions? All right. Yeah. Open debate topic reads exactly what Izzy just said. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, oh, sorry. I was going to be like, wait, no, hold on. <laughs> what are the benefits of student senate participating in yearly student leadership trainings as a collective group? <clears throat> Would anyone else like to elaborate on this open debate topic? Um, so in order to be active advocates, you can read this along the screen with me, um, for the student body, we need to work together on being equipped with the skills and knowledge to be able to be the best advocates we can be. Being trained elsewhere does not avoid the, con uh, the discussion or conversation from happening internally in the Senate. If we want to serve the students to our maximum capacity and capabilities, we cannot not be trained on how to deal with certain situations that have societal and health consequences on our campus. Um, two of the ones of that I researched was uh, Green Dot. Uh, which is a bystander intervention training that engages witnesses to interrupt situations that are imminent, imminently or potentially high risk for violence, increases self-efficacy, and provides skill building and specific strategies to increase the likelihood that trained individuals will actually intervene. I do know we have something similar in EverFi, but I do feel as though a hands-on interactive course works best. Um, because again, a lot of us can click through EverFi and uh, Green Dot really, really engages us to kind of work through those situations and how we can best respond to them. Um, another one that I thought was important is QPR, suicide prevention, uh, which is uh, question, persuade, persuade, question, persuade, and refer. Uh, it aims to reduce uh, suicidal behaviors and save lives by providing innovative, practical, and proven suicide prevention training. So in addition, um, being trained in these important topics can provide us a perspective on how to best serve the student body and be allies to all students in creating a safer campus. Some of these resources are right here on our campus. We have many, many counselors who do bystander, who do QPR. I mean, we have additional EMS coordinators and external resources that can do Narcan, that can do CPR and AED training. Um, and we have the ability to collectively come together to acquire the knowledge that it can influence the initiatives, bills, and resolutions we pass, uh, as well as take some of these environmental factors in con into consideration on what is seriously persisting um, on our campus. So some may say that we do not need these skills um, because a lot of this may not really pertain. Um, but learning about more about these topics can help us understand how to address certain situations on campus in different ways, offer creative solutions and create a safer environment that allows empathy to guide us in these initiatives. Thank you. I'd like to elaborate on this. Is more, go ahead. Uh, and further elaborating, uh, I researched about the safe zone initiatives and implicit bias trainings. Uh, as a student senate and over the past couple of weeks, we've been uh, called upon by the student body to create a safe zone on campus uh, for all students. And, I and we feel that this way is a step in the right direction for us as a senate to take the first step to create a safe zone for those people who are calling on us to create um, a safe zone. Uh, safe zone uh, training, more specifically, is a training about the LGBTQ plus community and dealing with biases and 
um, other prejudices towards that community. Uh, implicit bias training is also a training uh, geared towards uh, implicit biases against other nationalities and cultures. Um, and overall, uh, both trainings are geared towards making a groups on campus uh, feel more comfortable and less, less um, more comfortable on campus and feel we have the skills in order to make them comfortable on campus. Um, like I said, I will reiterate, uh, in the past couple of weeks, we've been called upon by the student body uh, to create a safe zone. Um, and this is not the end all be all solution to do that, obviously. Um, but this is a step in the right direction. Um, one of my things is uh, it takes 21 interactions to change an initial opinion uh, on a group, on an individual in general. Uh, this is not all 21, obviously, but this is a way for us to begin to change our beings and making that safe space on campus. And I yield to Right. Well, I'm going to read for both me and Danny. So, so Danny said, as a Senate, we have a responsibility to teach the students about mental health awareness and how we can look out for the warning signs to help uh, help others around us. So, in her, she talked about NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Health Illness, which is an organization in the United States that is committed to giving treatment and spreading awareness on mental health to family members and those who struggle by using the information from NAMI. We could, we, could, we could provide data on how students struggle, resources available to those who struggle, and uh, advice, advice to those students and others to help those who are struggling. So being part about mental health, health awareness breaks down the stigma and shows that it's okay to reach out for help. Uh, she also talks about crisis evals, uh, which are evaluations done at the school to those who may be at harm with themselves or others. This could be helpful in the case they are too nervous to go to the hospital themselves. And she says, what I think, it only takes so much time for someone to reach out for help if the nice slash feel like they are a burden and then feel like they cannot reach out for help again. The more we show that we are an institution that supports the students' well-being, the more that we will be able to spread the word. So for my part, I talk about the sister school. And so I found that Stone, so our first one, Stonehill offers uh, QPR, which helps with uh, suicide prevention. Uh, they also offer peer-to-peer -peer mental health training, bystander intervention training, which helps prevent sexual assault, how to deal with the situations that seem like they can pose a threat. Uh, one law which helps to deal with dating violence and family around, which is a self-defense course for women where they learn the basics of self-defense. Merrimack does some of the previously mentioned courses that, they, that I mentioned up there. They also offer Green Dot, the one that uh, Izzy mentioned before. It's, uh, they also happen to do similar online courses to us with sexual assault and alcohol prevention. But what makes it different is that they offer it to both first year and second year students. So they have to take it two years in a row, not just one. Uh, Johnson and Wales, they, uh, they, they, uh, the university addresses bystander behavior by participating in programs like the performance and also Green Dot as a core component of its cross comprehensive violence prevention efforts. Provides QPR training to students, faculty, and staff sponsored by the Student Affairs, Care Team, and Catholic Services at the University of Washington. Uh, and Salve Regina does FAG, Student Government Association. Uh, we could not find any, but we could not find anything on mandatory bias training or other safe zones. Uh, but students, faculty, and staff are trained in Green Dot and have days dedicated to raising awareness on Green Dot. So I believe that based on how our sister schools act, we should do this because they do a lot of it, it seems, themselves too. And a more, I guess I would say, more with the student body and leadership working together, not just on like a screen, like whatever kind of leadership. More peer to peer, face to face with someone teaching you, lecturing you, learning, which is a better way to retain things than doing it just online. You like to elaborate as well? Um, I just want to, I guess, wrap it up. 
Um, I think in some, we did find a lot of good uh, evidence and background information that really, really does kind of push this to be something that we look for to have conversations continuing on in Senate, if that makes sense. Um, while I do know that a lot of us are a part of other different things, being RAs, peer mentors, Howie's, a variety of other different things, and we do get those trainings, I do think um, having that internally within Senate as a group and how it applies to us can really, really be beneficial. Um, as we're all, I know, very, very passionate about being allies to students here on campus in our own very different ways. Um, and I think if we have a variety of different resources and information presented to us, we can um, have this information and we can apply it in different ways because also a lot of these programs do offer statistics and how persistent these problems are on our campus and why it's important that we have these prevention programs um, and programs that work on post-care and intervening as well. So um, with that being said, would love to open up to discussion. All right, all those in favor of opening this open debate topic for discussion, all those opposed. Extensions, all right, this open debate topic will now be open for discussion. I will start a speaker's list, but any of the sponsors like to start first or do you want me to just open the floor? Um, I, open. I would open the floor, yeah. All right, <laughs> open the floor for open debate. Does anyone like to add to the speaker's list? Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to bring up like another one that wasn't on that list um, that I participated in last year that was just called mental health first aid training. I am that, I'm certified in that. Yes, yes. I have been doing that this year. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there because that's uh, another good one. It's kind of similar to the um, suicide prevention one, but it's included in it and uh, it has more sort of like general information. So. Can I throw that out there? <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to direct on that. Um, fantastic course. Um, I definitely wanted to look into it, but unfortunately, it does cost money. Yeah. So unless somehow, if everyone would be interested, whether it's whether it's from the student senate budget or we get funding externally, um, that's definitely something that we have to all do over the break because it is kind of an eight-hour class where we do four hours online and then four hours in training. Um, but it is fantastic. It's a two-year certification, um, and it really goes over kind of it covers that mental health awareness that Danny was talking about. Um, while we do have a Rhode Island National Alliance and Mental Illness Association, this also kind of covers a lot of things about mental health awareness um, and really covers the basics, post-care prevention and what to do if you're ever engaged in a situation like that. So thank you for bringing that up. Great training, I'll third on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else want to join the speakers list? Ashley? So mental health issues, um, Title IX incidents, bias incidents are all things that sadly the student body here experiences. And so if we as a student Senate are supposed to represent the student body, then how are we supposed to represent them if we don't have an understanding of how to address it in the space? So I personally would be in favor of this because it would be beneficial to be able to represent the student body and have knowledge of what they do. I'll direct on that. I mean, that's top down. It's not just the you know, Title IX. Uh, it's top down through all the training that we've got. Uh, it's all aspects. It's all walks of life. It's all people that we deal with and interact with. Basics and those are the people that we represent. Yeah. Uh, so, pursuant to Article 4, Section 7 of our consent bylaws, I'm just curious as the sponsors, what administrators and or uh, members of the bargaining community are you reaching out to and how do you have a contact with the bargaining community? Would you like to direct? direct. Um, so, <clears throat> first things first is that um, we weren't going to engage faculty if for some reason student senate would not be in favor of this because one I don't want to waste people's time but then again we do have the resources on campus um, and while I do not have the full answer to that that is that would be the next step of what this would be um, because again I don't want to force something down everyone's throats if half of student senate isn't even willing to participate in it um, but again we do have administrators on campus who can provide this and are actually doing training next semester to do this, including CPR, Narcan, bystander, you know, and a variety of different things. So that is um, how I will answer that to the best of my ability. I do it. Can't direct off a of direct. Would you like a point of information? Yeah, I was, yeah. Uh, Jen Stanley, with our meeting tomorrow with Jen Stanley, I know that a lot of what was discussed in this open debate topic will certainly be brought up 
be brought up tomorrow with her. She has a whole presentation planned on um, what she's done in the past. It has included the green dot and things like that. Uh, safe zone, I believe. Um, but obviously those things are not prominent um, in, on our campus already. So it'll definitely, Senate will have the opportunity to ask lots of questions tomorrow on what we can do further. So I think this is a great topic. It's not, it doesn't end here. Um, as the Senator said, it's, it's time to push forward. Derek? Uh, I personally, I love this idea. I think it's very important that we're all aware of how we can just deal with mental health because we did just go through mental health month and it is, we don't, we don't really always know what people are dealing with. My question, this is sponsored, would be though, would you see this as something not just within the Senate, but also for other student leaders? Would you like to direct? Yes, please. Um, so actually what I'm working on right now with the EMS coordinator under Pete Dave um, is a variety of different, um, and I've talked to Ali about this, uh, on, a, on a safety series almost. So allowing students, especially student leaders, to participate in CPR and AED trainings, potentially working to get the funding to um, fund the $25 certifications that you need. Uh, that also includes Narcan training and equipping students with Narcan. Um, but also kind of working to have like a month of just talking about safety on campus. So, um, you know, uh, Green Dot and making sure that that's something that's available, QPR um, and Safe Zone and how those are interlinked. So definitely it's something that I want to bring more to, to student leaders on campus and just students who want to know more about it because, um, you know, this is, this is something that affects everyone and public health is something that does affect every single individual. And if we all don't participate, then we are going to have significant societal and health consequences here on our campus. Um, and that's not acceptable in my book. So uh, it is something that I'm looking to expand, especially for next semester. Alex? Um, you talked a lot about like um, first aid training, the Narcan training, all the other trainings. Could you elaborate on what the training like involves with and what certifications will come out of it? Yeah. So, oh, thanks. So yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so not all of them come out with a certification training just because some of them are just basic informational knowledge. So for example, the Narcan training, you come out with knowing how to identify an overdose, what to do when you do suspect that someone has um, potentially overdose and how to administer Narcan and what to do after that. Um, CPR and AED, you do potentially come out with a certification. We're looking to potentially maybe do that and um, potentially find the funding for it. So every student who does participate can have a 20 or $25 certification, but you learn how to perform CPR, what to do during those moments. All of these are hands-on as well. So you do learn one-on-one -on -one how to do these um, and how to work in AED. Uh, for Safe Zone, that's also just really basic knowledge as to what um, Jack had, another a previous center had mentioned. Um, including, you know, talking about stereotypes, biases, how to be an ally to LGBTQIA plus students. Uh, Green Dot is also another interactive, um, <clears throat> an interactive training that really, really engages students to learn more about uh, just bystander intervention, how to intervene, what to do during those times, um, and how we can best uh, use that information. But also on top of that, all of these um, provide information in a way as to why these programs are created and why they're important and integral into student life here on campus. So, and also if we did do the certified mental health first aid training, that is a two year certification and it goes over um, uh, the uh, basic, I completely forget what it is, I'm blanking right now, but the kind of the little code that they go by on what to do, um, you know, self help resources that you can provide, some of the most prevalent mental health. Um, issues like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, um, and what to do during those situations. And it also engages you in conversations with other peers in the room on how to go about handling those, how to handling those situations and also what to do for yourself. So uh, are there any additional questions? Also implicit bias training. Implicit bias training really just breaks down and talks about um, maybe the unconscious biases that we have in our mind. Some of those look different depending on each person that presents it to you, but in the ones that I have done, that we have done identity wheels and um, what is kind of say like the most prevalent identity that you have, or um, what's the one you think about the most? What's the one you think about the least? Um, also talking about some of the most often stereotypes against um, say people of color, for example, and how you know maybe we break down those biases in our head 
and sometimes how to really go about them and catching yourself in those moments when you do have a potential implicit bias. Um, again, a lot of these do not come out with certifications. I will make that a disclaimer right now. Um, maybe one or two of them, but the thing is, is that someone told me tonight is that knowledge is power. And the more we are informed about these um, perspectives and problems that are happening right here on our campus, right in our backyard, uh, it really, really will inform on how we can best serve the student population, especially regarding the initiatives that we do each semester, what committees will look like regarding these and how we can best shape these initiatives around um, some of these problems. So, yeah. Can I direct a point of information? Point of information. Yeah, and I mean, to further uh, Izzy's point, I mean, these courses range from anything to, you know, your online EverFi type courses to the in-person seminars or uh, people talking. So it's really about, uh, this, this conversation is more about kind of getting that idea of what you'd be in favor of versus bringing to the table, here's what we're gonna do. Um, and that was what this topic was about. Um, if, if you have a preference for one or the other, or what we wanna do, that's kind of what we wanna hear from you. I have Sophie next to the speaker's list. Okay, I was gonna, I guess it's kind of more of this information than like a whole list, but um, I'm on the uh, search committee for a new assistant director of career enhancement initiatives, and I just know we're like specifically looking for someone mm -hmm. to be able to give same zone training. Great. So I just wanted to throw that out there as. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, can I comment? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, no, thank you. Because that I knew I, that's who I exactly received the training from. Um, I received it in a class and she's absolutely amazing. And I do hope we have someone who's engaging and personal as her um, who brings these safe zone trainings to campus. Um, but otherwise, something I might want to add is that um, this may not all happen at the beginning of spring semester. This might be something that we we'll try and do throughout the semester, especially because we won't we might, we might not have an assistant director um, by the time the spring semester starts. So that might be a training that we might not be able to do until say the middle of the semester. So um, this will not be, if everyone's in favor of all of these or select few, this will probably not be all at once um, just because that's a lot of information to throw at you, but something that we kind of talk about throughout the semester so we can keep those conversations going. Ava. Um, so this is like a, I guess like it's something you could bring into this mm -hmm. that we were thinking about. So we we talked about them um, before, but um, sex rules. Um, there are Title IX compliant lecture that discusses sexual assault awareness and prevention, but not only that, but it um, encourages and educates students to understand like safe sex practices, interactions, exploration, and they like they train students to understand and recognize all forms of sexual violence along with proper methods for healing or helping survivors survivors who experience any form of sexual misconduct, and. We quite often screen dot focuses a lot on the prevention, mm -hmm. or, um, and they don't really focus about like what happens if it happens to you. Mm -hmm. So I feel like if we're going to be talking about like not we, <laughs> actually we're talking about like Title Nine and all of that stuff, I think it's really important that this would be someone who would bring to campus and go through whether it's something that all the orgs do together, um, something like that, mm -hmm. and so that we have a lot of people sitting in on this. I think it's great. Um, about and understanding because not everyone goes through something like that, so you don't have you don't want to sit in. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, and she also the uh, the woman that put it on, she's um, a writer who's actually she's also a comedian. So she kind of brings, um, not in, like she kind of brings an appropriate humor to these like really triggering topics so that we can have these conversations. So I mean, I can give you more information about her later, but I definitely think that this would be someone that would fit in really well with um, what you talked. Yes, yes, you can send me any information. This is for also my own personal knowledge. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> can, ooh, point of personal privilege, can you send me that link too? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you uh, mentioned that some of the courses are, are going to be on EverFi or like online. Is there, is, is every single course have the ability to be half online and half hands on, or is there some that have no like choice but to be strictly online? Because as stated before, you can just click through EverFi and get over yeah. it like without really learning. Mm -hmm. So I wanna know if that's possible for us to be more hands-on with that. Can I measure? Yeah. Okay, so we, we can kind of go back and forth if you want to add. Um, so most of them are in person. I have done Green Dot in person. I've done QPR in person. I've done Safe Zone. In, over on via Zoom, but that was still kind of an in-person lecture component. Implicit bias training I've done, which has interactive. Um, 
And then, so the certified mental health aide, so that is a very, very lengthy course. Four hours of it are online, but you can't pass it unless you have an 80. So you have to very go through the, the really hard depth of the knowledge to be able to pass it. And if you kind of go through it, you're not gonna be able to move to the next step. Um, so that's a great component that I loved about it because it, it makes you really, really take in the information so you can pass it um, because you have to have a certain grade and over. Um, and then the other four hours is in-person training where you do that interactive, like what to do in a situation, how would you handle this? So, um, but there are other components of it to it that might be online that I may not know of. So Zach, uh, Jack, if you do know of that, um, please uh, bring that information to the table. But as of to my knowledge, that is what most how most of them run. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, just a build, further build. I mean, the, the online uh, part uh, was kind of just more of, at least for me, was just kind of throwing it out there to get the uh, get the idea out there. Uh, obviously, it seems like uh, it doesn't seem like a popular <laughs> opinion. Um, so it would be more apt to us trying to get in-person lectures of that style. Again, more of just kind of a throwing darts, see what it, what sticks. Um, uh, but yeah, in-person, in person, uh, it, 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 it's open for um, change and debate. Uh, it's, it's not set in stone. It doesn't have to be online. But none of them have to be. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike. Uh, well, first, I want to say that I'm really impressed with the amount of information that you're able to put in the open debate topic and how helpful has. And of course, um, our organizations as well. Um, and I also want to voice my own opinion on it. And I want to say I'm in full support of this um, open debate topic. Um, just thinking about how many people that each of us will interact with us in the entirety of Senate, being able to just help yourself, help someone else, be able to intervene or even save someone even if it's just one person is still better than zero mm -hmm. and being able to also echo that of what other organizations do just shows that this is something that I believe that we should be doing. Allie. Um, in terms of executing this and kind of like, hmm, like which one should we do? Which one should we not do? I think I really liked the idea that was put forward about making it a series mm -hmm. or like obviously not all at once, like, Here's this huge amount of information, but in a way, make it a series to where it is interactive because obviously we learn better through, I personally think through like conversations and not just sitting and listening because you can sit and listen, but what is truly like going through and especially with these topics at hand, it's not enough to just sit down and listen. There needs to be conversations had. So in terms of a series, I really like that idea because it almost makes it like, okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to learn this and I'm going to talk about this, but also this connects to this and this connects to that. Um, so you're not sitting through a whole day's worth of presentations, but like, oh, you know, this series on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on this day, we're going to talk about this Tuesday. Ooh, let me let this sit. So that way on Wednesday, I can bring what I've learned at this Monday thing to this event. Um, so in terms of executing it um obviously it's like what topics are we going to choose and which ones are we going to redefine especially after hearing um green dot versus the topics rules the sex rules i really was in favor of that as well mm -hmm. um but like how can we make it productive and interactive and how can students truly take away what's being um presented so i really like the idea of a series joe uh, all right I'm not going to speak for this. No, okay. Um, so I just want to put out there great, obviously amazing work on the um, open debate topic. Obviously, I think we're all in favor of it. But I just want to say, as an RA, I truly don't know where I would be without the training that I have had. I think everyone who in this room who is either an RA or has had similar trainings can agree that you don't think you might, you don't really know you need it until you've had it. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I really needed this. So um, I just want to put it out there that these trainings are amazing. Great job on the open debate topic. Um, I think this would be something really useful, especially if we were to bring it up in retreats and have these in our retreats. Um, I think it would make our retreats really useful and something that we can move forward in, in the future and really get those tangible things out of our retreats. So I'm going to say that. Um, Ashley, I have next from the speaker. Um, kind of going off of the previous senator's point about making sure that if we were to go through these, 
making them productive because I know there's a lot of people sitting at the table who are student leaders in multiple facets. So they already have some of these trainings because of other things they do such as RA. So if we were to do these trainings, um, rather than doing the same trainings that other student groups are doing, maybe having them be on the same topics, but different trainings from different people. So that way we get um, multiple views rather than some of us getting the same presentations over and over. So that way we get more and new Adam. Going back to the question of what are the benefits of student senate doing the leadership <laughs> as a group, yeah. I do think there is a strong benefit um, to a previous senator's point. It might be beneficial to look at the lens of everything that we do through the lens of servant leadership, which is making sure that we're putting the people that we're serving first and then focusing on how we can best do that. For specific benefits, I think it allows us to really make sure that we understand the diverse perspectives that the student body has and helps us understand the opinions and how they come to campus is different than how they leave campus. And I think this would allow us to do that. And I would make a motion to straw poll. Second. Second. Does the student senate find that there's sufficient benefit of conducting yearly trainings as a group? With the answers being yes and no. I would like to add that anyone can vote in a straw poll, even the audience and our advisors. All right, so all those in favor of taking the straw poll question? Motion and adopt by name. <laughs> Is there any dissent? All right, so let the record show that the student senate is in favor of this open debate. Oh, sorry. Sorry. You voted to open the question. Oh, yeah. You have to ask the question. If you voted to adopt by name, it's in the senate. No, it's not. Oh, okay. Never mind. You still have to ask. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, we could do that too. I mean, you know, I really don't know where I do. No, I know. Exactly. So we will be doing it. Yes. All right. All right. All those in favor of this open debate topic? Yes. Answer yes. Oh, I can vote. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cool. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness, it was everybody in favor. Woo! All those not in favor. All right, those abstaining. So let the record show it was 25 in favor and zero not in favor. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go open to beat group two. <laughs> I'm sorry, let me just say that. Um, Jared. Oh, all right. Uh, so I was just looking at something, just kind of something that I've been looking at for a little bit, but I feel like we're missing one component of this perspective. It's, it's also about just relationships. And I was looking at the One Love Foundation. They do a lot with healthy relationship, this relationship education intervention on unhealthy relationships so like helping out friends and i guess i'm just curious you know for people who came up with the topic have you considered something for that is that correct yeah uh, i forget which one but one of these schools that i worked up uh, it does deal with constant relationships and how the cloud design and deal with that. I forget which one. They did have a program. I just forget the name of it. Too. Point of information. Mm -hmm. um, so, One Love is a very, very, very lengthy yeah. online course. Um, and it's definitely something we want to consider because we want a variety of different perspectives. So, that may look like taking the necessary courses. If, if, if for example, we did choose to do One Love. Um, we would only take some of the necessary components just because of how lengthy it is. Um, there's a lot of, there's uh, like a 45 minute to one hour movie, a lot of different videos, but it's a fantastic component to add to it. I mean, I do agree that relationship development does need to be something that is um, included in this, but we do have um, a couple different programs that we can look at, um, especially also to kind of gauge what works best for the student senate. And if we did wanna offer this to uh, student leaders as well. Um, so we would really have to talk to some of our next step people on maybe what would be the best bet. 
Um, but I, I do agree with your statement, um, and I will definitely take that into consideration as we're developing this one. Thank you. Um, I just want to throw out a point of information. Um, this question is specifically asking what if there are benefits to these leadership training, but specific leadership training to some So if anybody has any other thoughts on, oh, maybe we should do this one or anything like that, that's a different. I just wanted to say that uh, the school that offered in Stonehill and uh, that, uh, okay, what was I going to say now? <laughs> I think we got the gym. Thank you, everyone. Any other, anyone else to, for the speakers list on this open debate topic? Motion. All in favor of closing this open debate topic? All those opposed? Sentence is open debate topic. If now it's closed. Are there any other topics of debate for open debate? Adam. What concluding processes would be beneficial for non-chartered student groups requesting Senate funding? Would you like to elaborate? Yes. Yeah, so uh, this came up through the bylaw review committee uh, this morning. And historically, us as a student Senate, we have not had a strong, developed, consistent, comprehensive process to the conclusion of a student or student group requesting funding for general allocations or the academic allocations committee. For some context, uh, student groups can come into Senate such as Hawkward, Howie's, Delta Sigma Pi, men's ice hockey, and numerous others to request funding that are outside of what they're allocated. And they do that through a presentation to student Senate. For academic allocations, that is the process for students or a group of students going to an academic conference or competition, not for course credit or required by their course. In reviewing both the general allocation request and the academic allocations request, the conclusion, the concluding process has been lackluster with us as the student senate really not following through well on having a well thought of process of how it would look to see this process conclude, we provide the funding, the student or student group goes, attends, gets the educational content and the engagement. What comes next so that we can make sure that it was beneficial? And I will yield to another member of the bylaw review committee. Zach? Uh, so I did some digging into some of our sister schools, one in particular with Salve and Nina. Uh, Salve currently, as you can see, depicted in this document as a conference attendance and also something called external funding request. Uh, and to kind of give you a rundown or a summary, if you will, is the external funding request basically just goes over in the last, the last clause of that paragraph, uh, that making a request and staying from a vote of said requests. But if you follow that, the go over and over to conference attendance, there's an important sentence in the second paragraph where it talks about what it expected uh, once they receive the said funding. Uh, so that the delegates who attend the conference are expected to present what they learn at said conference at an SROYOU day student exposition. We're not fully accurate at what that is, uh, but it sounds to me for interpretation purposes that that would be something where the said official would have to come before the body of the said group to report what took place. So that's kind of just giving you in a nutshell what Salve is currently, and I'll yield to another person on the bottom. Right. Um, this will definitely increase the amount of consistency that we'll have with academic allocations. Um, and also noting that um, with other um, sister schools, it's actually hard to find information on where to get to these processes. And with RWU, we could actually be a bit of a spearhead to actually try and create a bit more consistency within academic allocations. Adam. And um, just to kind of add more context, past senates have uh, done a wide variety of different mechanisms after talking with our advisor, as she does have institutional knowledge here. Uh, some senates have done encouraged groups to do a university-wide presentation to the student body that the senate would be encouraged to attend. Uh, some senates have done a letter to the student senate that the group would write. Others have done a report either orally or via PowerPoint to student senate during open floor for non-senators. And there used to be a paper handout uh, right near the office door that student groups were taken, fill out and hand back in. And on the bottom page, thank you. The current concluding process is listed here and that's uh, for academic allocations, the student group must complete the follow-up process at 
the discretion of the academic allocations committee of what that looks like, not really set in stone. And for general allocation requests, it lists that the student group must complete the follow-up process for the student senate. And there's an online form, but again, there's never been an online form on Hawkwood. So the bylaw review committee wanted to bring this forward to find out what including process would be most beneficial for non chartered groups. Is that a uh, motion to limit debate to 15 minutes. Okay. All those opposed? Sentence? Okay. Um, but. Um, Zach, did you want to get on the speaker's list for minutes? Once it's open. Okay, yeah. sounds good. Anyone else for elaborating on this? Go ahead, Zach. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to go. Oh, okay. All those in favor of opening this open debate topic? Second. All those opposed? Extensions. <clears throat> open debate topic is now open and the timer is now set for 15 minutes. I'll start the speaker's list and Zach is first. Um, just for clarification's sake, um, what went into determining that the current process is like lackluster? There is no process. <laughs> oh, there is. No. <laughs> uh, Brian and Zach. Uh, so my question is, why was there no process before? Adam? So just to kind of historically, there's been a lack of a process. What we're really trying to decide here is what process would be most beneficial. So what the student Senate feel would benefit the student body in that? We know historically there's not been a good process. We're really looking to the future. Yeah. So my, my proposition for this, and I would really like to have dialogue on this, um, is there's no mentioning of treasurer anywhere in the complete process of this non-charted uh, allocation of a non-charted student group. I think personally that the treasurer should have a voice or some say in the process of measuring progress or some sort of report or his own report to give back to Senate. Uh, but also I feel as though it's got jurisdiction within that law. It really falls under treasurer. That's personally where I feel. Measurement wise, I, that I feel as though we could do through a talk form, form. Uh, that would have, again, oversight from the treasurer. Uh, and also, I think we could also have something where a presentation is conducted uh, to Senate after the treasurer meeting and they report on that. Not my two cents. I, I think that would be some, some po positive ideas to bring them forward. Ashley? Um, what are the processes for student Senate chartered groups who request Senate funding? Like, what is the follow up for that? They go through finals. Yeah, to get the money, but following up. So, five. Uh, there were three eight, directs. Yes, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Who would like to direct, like, first and foremost? There was Adrian, there was Mike, there was Zach. I see Mike. You see Mike? Okay. Um, I imagine, really quick, I can ask a question first. That's like good. Point of view. Um, do you mean, like, after they've get, gotten the funding for, like they came in for a funding request, right? Yeah. So then you'd go to a purchase request, which would go straight to the treasurer. Point of information. Sure. Historically, when a Senate chartered group receives funding, the there is no follow-up process because it's comprised in the sender club check-in process and they report directly through student Senate through those means. And then after their budget, goes up during budgeting weekend, there's also that discussion as well. So there's different processes in place for that because they're Senate reps. So our advisors still like to direct? No. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> they're still going to be direct. Um, so point of, point of information I'll do. Um, this question is very much asking 
how do, does the student senate want this follow-up to look? Do we want it to be a university presentation, a letter that sent something else beyond that, that senate hasn't done in the past? Just to help with the framing of the question, I feel like I need to say that. <laughs> what about Brian and Josh? So going off that question, I think a presentation would be helpful just to like show, because like you can say something in a letter and like say you did it, but like actually showing us what you did like in a presentation, I feel like would hold them more accountable and make sure that they actually do it and actually spend the money on what they said they're going to spend the money on. Similar to um, what a previous senator had said, uh, I feel like a presentation similar to how um, a trial club would do, maybe giving them a floor for non senator direct or oh cool Ava there you go are you talking about so like let's say like a few years ago for our um competition that we did so then are you saying like if when we came back we would have a presentation that we could just present the students on it like in a student senate meeting or are you talking about like more of like I don't know. I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. Doesn't seem yeah. to so no. that's sort of what we're asking here. Okay. What do we want that follow up process to look like? Okay. Do we want it to be a presentation, a letter, just a report at open floor? It literally can be anything. It does not just have to be what the Senate in the past has historically done. If you're like, oh, well, this idea would be great, but it's not something Senate has done in the past, then fine. We want it to be something that's beneficial to not only Senate to hear how we are getting our funding and like how our funding is being used, but like. Super not making it. Anything that's added. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Uh, Alex. I'm in favor of a presentation. I'm also in favor of a possible, like, for our, like, to, for student time, for our century, we had to have an itemized bill of what exactly we got. I'm in favor of, like, not exactly the itemized bill, but to know exactly where the money is for, like, say, like, this amount of money went for this part of the funding and et cetera. I'm going to go Adrian. Um, I would say that in regards to this idea of a presentation as a follow-up, I would kind of throw back at you, like, the groups are going to have to present to the students to request the funds. So I'd be curious to know how different would this presentation be that would be in the conclusion. So, like, what new information would there be other than the fact that, like, oh, yes, you know, we got to connect with this person, people really like their ideas, by da, da, da. But really, what new content would the Senate want to hear from the original presentation requesting the funds to the concluding presentation? Where it's after everything's said and done. And Ashley next. What's John? Cool. Izzy? Okay. Um, I would say I'm not entirely in favor of a university wide presentation to the student body, just to second what our advisor had stated. Um, unless there is going to be some, like guidelines that kind of outline what those two presentations look like in presentation of what they need funding for and in presentation of the conclusion. Um, I'm more in favor of a report, just shortly, or like a PowerPoint, um, but also ensuring that it's accommodating to students' needs, because not every student is very, very comfortable when it comes to presenting or reporting out, um, and or they may have, um, you know, something that may, that may prohibit them from reporting. Um, so I, I do think in consideration of prior points, a report would be best but again, we do have to do what is best for the student senate and the senate body. Yeah. Um, previous to what is, uh, to reiterate what a previous senator and our advisor said, um, for the reason that uh, I feel like a presentation be slightly redundant, I would also be in favor of a um, report at open floor for non senators. Um, but to a point of a previous senator, 
Um, kind of guidelines, given that this may be like their first time ever at Senate, kind of like maybe a format of what we want to hear about um, an event or conference or something of that nature, I think would be uh, the best option for this. Kind of turn them into a procedure where confusion also there's six minutes left in the debate um josh um <clears throat> point of inquiry how would it be if i have like so there's a question asking what is the concluding process how would i um suggest a concluding process to be let's say voted upon to end the debate how is that process you yeah. could do a straw poll saying is the Senate in favor of hearing a report from students during open floor for non senators as the concluding process of the season? And then, yes, the answer would be yes, no, or abstain, or whatever thing you wanted to add. Okay. That, and then that would be brought back to like bylaw to. Yes. And that would be brought back to like bylaw, like based on the open debate topic and how we're feeling about that. You brought that to bylaw for them to, I'm guessing, bring a vote or. Yes. Cool. All right. I also, um, I just wanted to rephrase um, the point I had made previously. Um, when I meant presentation, I didn't necessarily mean like a slideshow. I mean like, <clears throat> so as someone who has like a lot of applications and time commitments, <clears throat> I find it even hard to make some of the things that I want to make it to my course. So to have, I know personally for the barbershop, there was a lot of time constraints and we couldn't make it to finance. So they're doing like an emergency finance meeting. But like maybe not every club will be able to even make it to um, open floor for not senators. So um what my idea for a concluding process would be any um any 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 way to show any way that they they the club um, feel is an accurate way to represent and show what they've used um, the funding for. What that be like an Instagram post showing how their event went or what they used it for, and then have it brought up there an open floor for non senators if they're not able to. Actually, um, so I feel like there's a variety of reasons why the Senate would allocate money to different groups. Um, so I feel like there should be a variety of ways of like means of sharing uh, what they use the funding for after the math. Um, but I do definitely think that the follow-up is necessary to make sure we know that the money we are allocating they're actually using for what they're saying they're using it for. But then specifically, specifically for um, the money that is allocated in academic allocations committee, I feel like in a way um, for them to report back is to report back to the committee itself and then have um, the chair of the Academic Allocations Committee give a report at the student general senate meeting on what um, what was what they shared. So. Um. Looking at what would be beneficial for non chartered groups, keeping in mind time constraints and all, I think from the kind of points that were brought up, it's important to have a consistent follow up process, but one that does take into account timing and all. Personally, I think a report to be delivered during open on floor makes the most sense because if student groups cannot make it, it can be read by the secretary, but encouraging student groups to be present to really show Senate their experience. Joe? Uh, I just feel like it's kind of um, like, I feel like for instance, like barbershop, when after their fashion show, they told us on open floor that Monday, they're like, this is a huge success. And I feel like that kind of already does its point in saying like, they get the funding for whatever they took the funding for, and they use it in the fashion show. So I feel like it gets to the point. Zach? The only, the only thing, as I said earlier, I think another piece of information that we talked about earlier about the redundancy of a PowerPoint is having the treasurer somewhere in the conversation along with the journey process is imperative, where we haven't really talked about that today. Um, and I think, again, this really told them the jurisdiction of the treasurer. And in, in the lines that academic allocation does not really have jurisdiction of non chartered uh, clubs coming in before Senate for, for money. Uh, academic allocation deals solely with academic uh, space issues. So that's why I would be more in favor of that being the point of contact. But finding ways we can integrate some of these report ideas or uh, 
some other fashion, if you will, to have the treasure somewhere in that in that mental space. Information. <clears throat> that's what I would highly recommend. Uh, motion to extend the time by 10 minutes. Second. All the favor of extending the time by 10 minutes. All those opposed? Extensions. All right, the time is being extended by 10 minutes. I totally forgot who is, I think it was in the. Um, so I just have a question. So are we trying to define what those concluding processes look like and is how the tre treasurer looks like it's in that or is it specific to how the treasurer is involved in the concluding processes? So I'll direct to that. Um, the question is asking what should these conclusion, conclusive processes look like, whether that's a report that's read by the treasurer or they are reporting to the treasurer or they're doing a presentation or they're writing a letter or whatever we need to come to a conclusion about what that's holding. Okay, so to, I guess, sum it up, move this along. Um, the, as I think prior uh, senators have stated, uh, the treasurer, because this is non-chartered student groups, um, should be involved, whether that's, um, obviously I, imagine that you are involved in when they do come to ask um, and then following up on their event. Um, and then it could simply be a report. And as uh, other senators had mentioned, also allowing accommodation to report in different ways, because again, everything has a unique perspective to it. Um, and we shouldn't constrain it to just something that people can say, but also Keep it short and to the point because not everyone has the time to unfortunately come to open floor um, and it can just be handed off to the treasurer and that's also kind of how the treasurer is kind of involved in a way um but again that is just one person out of the 23 of us that are here so what i will say to that motion to shuffle second, second. second. Is the student senate in favor of a report to be delivered either orally or in person to the student senate during open floor lasting for no longer than five minutes? With the answers being yes and no. Second. 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 Right. So we'll be taking that struggle question. So all those voting yes on Adam's question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't say yes to. You're really. Oh, I need to vote too. By the way, Strapple. <laughs> Eighteen yeses. No. Anyone voting no? Extensions. <laughs> That one section. <laughs> yep. All right. All right. Yeah, we're yeah, we're in favor. Okay. Oh, did you have? I'm gonna veto that. Um, Adam. Motion to refer to the bylaw review committee. Second. All in favor of referring this to the bylaw review committee. Opposed. So just all right. This will be referred to the bylaw review committee. Motion to close. I'll be closing this open debate topic. Second. Second. All right. <laughs> now we close that specific open debate topic. Close open debate. Second. Second. All those people closing open debate. Motion All those topic. opposed. <laughs> so, all right. <laughs> all right. Any other? It's closed. Open debate. Closed. Motion to open new business. Old business. Second. All those people of opening old business. <laughs> All right. All is closed. Extension. Old business is now closed. I'm oh, sorry. Open. Old business is now open. Is there any piece of legislation for old business? I jack. All right. Using SS 4805, a resolution aiming to reestablish the university department committee. Would you like to elaborate? I would. Um, nice. So, <laughs> yes, uh, we have a charge. Awesome. Um, 
So over the course of the year so far, we've uh, discussed a lot of issues on campus. Um, I have with uh, Zach and Ashley and Tom, as, long, as well as other people on other faculty members on uh, that work here, um, including John King, Kate Tobin. Uh, we talked to Bill Seymour, uh, Brian Williams, and et cetera, but you don't care about that. Uh, so what this aims to do is um, reestablish a parking community that hasn't met in over five years. Uh, and that is a uh, committee that looks at a lot of different things that uh, the council uh, does not look at. Um, and those things are allocations of lots, parking studies, uh, tickets, fees, uh, maintenance of lots, uh, prices of permits, uh, and how parking is going to fit into the campus master plan. Um, so those are just some of the issues that we are looking to address. Uh, I know uh, we, I say we, the Public Admin Coalition did a uh, survey about parking and um, in a second I will yield to Zach and let him further uh, elaborate that. But um, yeah, so this is basically just a way of us trying to get back on the table some of the biggest issues on campus. Uh, as I will, I will quote Kate Tobin, the two biggest issues on campus are parking and food. Um, and that goes across uh, for as far as student life uh, is concerned. So, um, yeah, we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts, and I will yield to you. So, as previously mentioned, uh, the administration the experimental learning uh, component to the course has taken has taken on a huge project regarding parking and and so forth. Uh, so alongside that, we had Brian Williams and John King come before a uh, meeting. And this actually was talked about that John King urged Senate, or urged some senators in the room that the University Parking Committee should recommence as they have not met in the past five academic years. If you think about that, that's kind of concerning. That means I haven't met since 2015. A lot has changed on campus since 2015. Uh, allocation for lots. We have a new director of public safety. There's a many new directors of, uh, who have had a rollover. Uh, so there's new insight, there's new folks at the table that can bring forward some awesome ideas. Furthering that, the other thing I would also add is, as earlier mentioned, we had a survey sent out to the student body that received over 1,100 responses regarding parking. It is an issue. Uh, however, there needs to be a way to, to strategize and to strategically uh, tackle it. And this is the way where we can have many stakeholders from the Rogerland University Committee at the table discussing these said concerns, especially when we were just given the presentation for the campus master plan. There's many things that are going to need to be discussed. Uh, and this is why that, this committee should continue to meet uh, if what, wherever they deem is appropriate or necessary. Uh, the last thing that I'll add is from the list, I would like to point out that we've had numerous administrators, including conversations surrounding this open resolution from the Senate tonight. Uh, so I think that's just something to uh, take into consideration as well. And I'm more than welcome to uh, field questions regarding some of the people who are working on and also who are they going to be sent to as well. And I'll yield to another you know, uh, sponsor on this. Ashley? Um, so in the meeting that was had last week with Kate Tobin during the parking council time, um, we discussed this with her, the bringing back, encouraging the university to bring out the pay, and that's where we got the list of names, uh, the list of positions where we believe that who should um, be on the parking committee, and so it's like a lengthy list, but when you're looking at the list, the chief financial officer, chief staff, the majority of the people in these positions are different than the people who were in these positions five years ago. And so the committee would be comprised of the majority of um, new people, um, along with as far as representation from various student constituencies. Um, we believe that since 1,100 people responded, 1,100 undergraduate students responded to the survey, there's clearly the students want to see something happen, to want to see change, and it is our duty to represent those students mm -hmm. and make sure that change happens, which is why we also are encouraging that um, a member of student senate and potentially the parking council chair sits on there. But then we also need to keep in mind that parking 
on the Bristol campus, so not just for undergraduate students. There's also graduate students and law students here on the Bristol campus. So we needed to make sure that we incorporated those students and making sure their voice is heard as well on this committee. All right, so, well, all right, now we're gonna open the speakers list. I have Brian first. Well, let me just say, great presentation. Uh, that was very well done. And I gotta say, parking has been an issue on this campus. Every time I go down the well, no spots. <laughs> never, <laughs> like, never. Uh, my question, and I also have a quick question for this. Uh, my question would be, who would chair this committee? Would it be a student? Would it be one of us? Would it be the parking chair, whoever that may be? Would you like to direct? Oh, uh, direct. Uh, in the past, it's been the CFO. Uh, which is the chief financial officer who is the boss yeah, at this moment. Ah, I you know it's a sound. I'm sorry. Ali? Withdrawn. I think it's some, also important to note that we do have the Senate Parking Council, but that body serves as one of its primary functions to adjudicate parking tickets. And that's where a lot of the time is spent is adjudicating parking tickets and making sure that students' thoughts and concerns and parking appeals are heard. And there's only one member of public safety that attends those meetings, but encouraging a university committee to be reformed would allow more voices to be at the table, more students involved, and also administrators that have a vested role and interest and would be able to help guide conversations forward to new and innovative solutions to solving our parking problems. Point of inquiry. But the so the council, the parking council that meets already, that group would be would focus on parking tickets, appealing those, et cetera, while the parking committee brought about today would focus on more of the issues surrounding parking, for example, the um, permits and lack of parking brought up in this resolution. Um, yeah. Um, so the the university parking committee would be addressing the issues that the parking council brings. Uh, there's a lot of things we can't touch. Uh, we cannot change the price of a permit, parking ticket, where you get a ticket, where you park, all the lots and all that. Uh, that has to do with um, a bigger picture of people. Um, it's not as, and even, um, even someone like uh, Kate Tobin, it's above her head in a way, as far as like allocating lots and stuff like that, it has to do a lot with the school uh, for reference, the reason that the law school can park in the law school parking lot, which is designated to new res, has nothing to do with public safety or Kate Tobin. It had to do with the law school's advocacy. So um, it would be bringing all those people in so that we can address those issues as a whole. And um, I'll fur further elaborate, because I know this question is going to come up. Um, the reason that Mark Leonetti or the CFO would be chairing this committee would be it has to do with the funding um, behind it in the general fund that he has. Mike. Um, so my biggest question right now is, so is this committee going to be a permanent fixture, or is it going to be something that is going to have um, a temporary place as a university committee? And if it is temporary, at which point will we, um, like how long will it be active? And for what reason would we want to disband it? Um, so when we talked with Kate Tobin in the past, this committee was something that would come about temporarily and then be disbanded. But since parking and the distribution of um, number of undergraduates and graduate students and law school students, since parking, the need for parking and who needs parking and needs park where is something that is ever changing. We are introducing this with the hopes that they will um, create this committee and it'll be something that um, does not dissolve at some point and something that will remain permanent. And to further that, it would be something that would meet more on a monthly basis versus a weekly basis. Um, Zach. Um, so my question was already answered, but um, I'll take this time to express my support for this uh, resolution um, because 
for one, it's been a while since we've had it. And as we've heard from previous meetings, there are a lot of changes coming to this campus regarding parking, pedestrian traffic, and like housing. Um, so I think it'd be um, severely beneficial to have this committee present for that. Point of inquiry. Um, isn't it that um, they are going to discuss in the coming time um, reallocating the lots again? And another question is that we are possibly invited, if so. I can interrupt. Sure. Uh, so <laughs> when we had Bill Seymour come in, uh, and he gave that very compelling presentation. Uh, for example, the gravel lot is going away. The ID lot. That's no longer going to be here in five years from now. Uh, a lot of the mechanisms on campus, like parking is essentially, to quote Bill, is we're reimagining parking on campus. It's really going through a process where this campus is not going to look the same five or 10 years from now. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, I mean, student input will be there. Uh, that's why the student is here. Brian, you're next in the speaker's list. Uh, so going off of Bill Seymour's plan, my question is, will you guys be working with like Bill Seymour in his office dealing with the master plan and whatever, like talking what about that? What information? That's not what this resolution is about. It's just discussing. I was asking like the part of the committee would be working. Oh, okay. That's what I was asking. <laughs> okay. I mean, that'll, that's something that they will discuss as part of this. Short answer, yeah. I should, I'm sorry, I should rephrase that. I should say, would the parking council be working with Bill Seymour and his office? Zach. My, am I in the speaker's list? What? Am I in the speaker's list? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I have more information. It's not really going to that. That was from earlier. Uh, so, no one really asked it, so I'm just going to clarify. So, the reason why we have Anthony uh, Rucko, who's a professor of computer science from SECOM, is he's developing an app for parking right now. It's uh, actually in the works. It's very exciting. Uh, so, currently, we have him in discussion with students of his that are creating a master app that would give you real, real time spot availability of lots. It would be able to measure what lots are being utilized. And this is something that, again, we can bring forward to the University Parking Committee as to what are we really using for our lots? Whereas we're not really counting what's in our lots. Uh, there's going to be some also some cool pieces within that. They're trying to consolidate university apps into one app. So the blue lights, another discussion, which is why we have Director of Public Safety on there, is there's going to be discussion regarding how can we bring the Rage Guardian app into the main app of the university. Uh, so these are some very important discussions, and that's why we have uh, the professor of computer science on there as well, um, who is very intrigued and excited to start working on this. Can I also speak with this? So another reason why we decided to not put um, an end time for when we want this uh, committee to potentially be dissolved is they could be meeting for all the spring semester and come to a conclusion on what they think the new program should look like and dissolve it, but within the next five years, there's going to be parking lots that are going to be moved away, parking lots that are newly added, new parking garages built. So even if they do like come to a conclusion on what parking looks like right now and how it should change, there's still going to be a lot of thinking within the campus master plan of how parking will change over the next five, 10 years, which is why we are also in favor of them continually meeting um, and not having any time. <laughs> sure. Uh, just to add on to that too, um, the reason when we had Bill come in, he really discussed with us that there are things currently that are tangible that could happen now. That like these easy switches and easy fixes just to hold us over until these spots are really there. Uh, such as for context, uh, when Steve Megarano, who was the director of public safety at the time, he was in favor of turning lot C into a residential parking lot and turning that gravel lot into a commuter lot, green stickers, uh, because that lot is always empty. Uh, the argument that the law school has more students, that's an argument for the university to decide on. And actually, uh, so again, a lot of these conversations are circling back to where is these conversations happening? Hence, the resolution. All right, there's no unless anyone else like to add or I'll take any motions. No,
Second. All favor, all in 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 favor, All right. Any other pieces of legislation for old business? Second. All in favor of closing old business? All opposed? Attention? Old business. Sorry. Old business is now closed. Motion to open new business. Second. All in favor of opening new business? All those opposed? Attention? New business is now open. Any pieces of legislation for new business? Adam. Introducing SS48-XXX, a bill appointing a student to the position of student general senator for regular consideration. Looking forward to hearing it. Any other pieces, Adam? Introducing SS48, a bill appointing a student to the position of general senator for regular consideration. Great. Adam? Introducing SS48-XXX, a bill appointing a student to the position of general senator for regular consideration. I'm looking forward to hearing it. <laughs> Any other piece of legislation for new business? Motion to close new business. Go ahead. Any other piece of legislation for new business? Motion to close new business. Second. Second. All those in favor of closing new business. All of new business is now closed. More announcements. Anyone have any announcements? Zach. So AA, uh, an important uh, sensitive email. Uh, group me text was sent out to the group me. Please acknowledge it and like it if you have not done so. So I know you've read it. Uh, and stay tuned to your email. Thank you. Adam. Reminder, we have caucus, so we'll take about a five minute break before we get started, and then we'll run into committee cabinet after. Just wanted to give a quick reminder um, fact, about factual introductions and all of this stuff, like the resolutions that are on the floor. Factual introductions should be strictly facts that are in reference to the open debate topic resolution bill. There shouldn't be personal thoughts or beliefs or anything of that nature in any of those. Um, because it's strictly a factual introduction, um, as well as um, the point of information is just remembering point of information is offering new and specific information to the topic at hand. If you're not a way to get a speaking turn and skip the speakers list. Um, and then lastly, we send the open debate topics and legislation in advance so we all can read it and review it and come ready with debates um, and do our own personal research on them. So just remember to do that and do your due diligence in that. Any other announcements? Second. All in favor of adjourning. All those opposed? Sentence. All right, we're now adjourned.